Man, okay. Um, before we get started this morning, because I know uh, I, people are tired, right? Am I tired? Hey, come on. But it's like a good tired. It's like something's been accomplished tired. At least that's, at least that's me. Uh, my voice is like gone. So um, I was over here singing, and I just got this vision. You ever like punched a cat in the throat? And then had it like meow. I feel like that's what my voice just sounded like, you know, over here singing. Uh, I do, I do want to do, but you know what? God thought it was beautiful, so you know, it's, that's all that counts. That's all that counts. Uh, I want to, I want to take a quick second before we start this morning, and uh, I just want to celebrate and recognize a couple of people. First thing up there, we've got this tech crew that has run lights, sound, the screens. Come on, they're amazing. They also are taking time out of their lives to come and uh, serve you guys because they believe in you. They believe in this generation. Um, and, uh, man, they're such a blast. So whenever you get a chance to say thank you to them, um, please make sure you do that. Make sure you do that. There's another team. Um, there's uh, a, a team that, that uh, has been with us all weekend. They've been making sure that we've been safe. They've been making sure that like if you get sick or something, they're going to take care of you. We've got a life safety team that I would love to point out and recognize. I can't see if any are in here or if they left already. They abandoned ship. But they've been so good this weekend, guys. This is one of the largest life safety teams we've had, and they've had a smile on their face, unless they've been tasing you. But they've had a smile no, actually, they probably had a big smile on their face, so they're like, finally. Um, but they've been so good. We would not, without those two teams right there, we would not be able to do this weekend. Um, it would just would not happen. And so can we just hear it one more time for tech, for life safety? Man, so good, so good. There's one, one other person we need to acknowledge. How many of you guys know Pat? I don't know where Pat's at. He's back there in the back. Man, Pat makes this thing happen. And we are so thankful for Pat. Man. <clears throat> Come on. Come on. Let's go. Pat, we love you. I just know there's some people that we're going to step through those gates and we're going to step into eternity and we're going to see a ripple effect. And Pat is one of those people that we're going to see thousands upon thousands of lives in eternity because of his ministry. Yes. So um, here's what I wanted to do this morning. Um, f first, first of all, uh, we have beat the crap out of this bell. Like, I don't know, this thing's got to go in the trash after or something, because this thing doesn't even work. I don't know, man. Okay, well, you know, it still works, but, man, that, that is such a sign of a good weekend. This is a sign of people who have decided that, man, something's going to be different. And so what I want to do this morning, real quick, I want to read a verse for you. And it's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. And like I said, I don't have a voice. I don't have any notes. Or I just jotted down a couple thoughts during worship. So um, we'll just see where this goes. Uh, but it's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, and it says this. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Come on, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. And then it goes into, into chapter 11. It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. Sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. And so here's the thing. Adam talked last night and um, he talked about how he's not normally an emotional guy. He has three things that make him cry. Do you remember what those three things are? 
Jesus Family Sports. Come on, you were listening. That's good. Here's the thing. Losing. Well, we had a different conversation, and he said sports. Losing. All right. So Adam and I are family, but um, we're very different in that sense because I'm very emotional, okay? There's n- very few movies that I've watched and not cried during, okay? Um, come on. Yeah. And now my kids got me watching all these Disney movies again, and I'm just, like, reliving all this torture. It's like Mufasa died again. Every time I watch, but spoiler alert, sorry, but every time I watch The Lion King, I'm like, maybe this is the time that he's, they got a new one coming out, and I'm like, maybe they'll save him this time. But no, he died. I'm super emotional, and, um... Uh, I I cry during a lot of things. I get caught up in the moment. I get caught up in whatever is happening around me. And uh, I feel like a lot of you are emotional too, and here's how I can prove it, Um, is because both Cameron, John, Adam spoke about having a baby girl. You haven't seen them. What if they're ugly? You're saying all without even seeing a picture. You have an emotional response to the fact that there's... Now, here's the thing. They're not. They're the most beautiful girls I have ever seen in my entire life. Like, I look at them, I'm like, I hope I don't have ever a girl because they're not going to look like that. So, like, you know, um, like they are. They're adorable. They're perfect. But you don't know that. You just hear they have a girl, and you're like, oh, you're emotional. Okay, you're caught up in the moment. And and here's what I have had to learn in my life. Because I'm so emotional, but this isn't just for people who are emotional. Actually, let me change that. I believe that even if we would think that we're not emotional, I don't cry during movies, I don't cry during sporting events, I don't cry during whatever. Even if you would think you're not emotional, we are all still emotional beings because we get caught up in what's happening around us. We get caught up in our circumstances, and we get caught up in in our current culture, and we get caught up in what is happening in the now and the here. And this is what I've had to learn in my life, and what I've had to learn in, in my walk with Jesus, is that feelings follow faith. Feelings follow faith. Because what we tend to fall into is the other way around, that faith follows feelings. That what I feel right now is going to lead my faith. What I feel right now, because this is what I can see, this is what I know, this is what I can experience, and so this is what I have. But what Scripture shows us is that faith leads over everything else. Your relationship with Jesus leads over everything else. And here's how I I experience this, because I've been here. You know, like when I was 16 years old, I went to a, a conference, and I'd been doing the church thing for about six months, and I was like, yo, it's kind of cool. This God thing seems all right. It seems like this is something, but I'm not ready to change my lifestyle for it. I'm just ready to be a part of this group and this community and this family, but I'm still going to do me. So then I go to this conference, and I'm going to be honest. I didn't want to go. I got tricked into going. Some of you know my story. I showed up to the charter bus hung over like crazy. Like, I did not want to go. I thought if I can make myself so sick, I won't have to go. My mom said, I paid, you're going, okay? You can be thrown up on the bus. I don't care. Get out of here, you know? like. And so I I showed up. I didn't want to be there, and I'm telling you, God wrecked my life during that week. Something happened where I knew in that moment this is real. Like this isn't just something that we do on the weekend. This isn't just some social club that we show up to and and we believe certain things and we feel like we're better people because of it. But I believed in that moment. I was convinced in that moment. I was divinely persuaded in that moment that there is a God in heaven who loves me, who has called me to a certain mission, and who has saved me so that I can have eternity in heaven. And something happened inside of me. And, and I knew in that moment, like, oh, man, I'm going to ring a bell. I'm going to tell whatever it is. I can't remember what we did that. Oh, it was a key on a keychain. Not as cool, but whatever. They gave me a key, and it had a scripture on it. And they said, hold this. And when you're tempted, hold it. Whatever. Um. <laughs> I was trying to remember the verse, but I can't. I can't remember what it is. Um, and so I was on fire. 
I was like, I'm going back, and, and I was, none of my friend group came with me. And so I was like, I'm going back, and, and I'm going to change the world. I'm going to change everything about my friend. I'm going to be like this evangelist, this missionary. Like, everything is going to be amazing. And I remember we got back on a Friday afternoon, or a Friday night, and then that Saturday there's this big party happening. And they're like, oh, Stoney, finally you're back. You want to come? We're like, we set this up. Come to this party. That was a long week, man. Where were you at? And I was like, yo, I can't come to the party. I'm like, what? Why? I was like, oh, man, I had, you know, you like build it up in your head. And you're like, I was like, oh, man. Okay, here's the thing, guys. I can't come to this party because I've met this dude named Jesus. And Jesus has saved me. He's redeemed me. He's restored me. I found out there's an enemy who wants to destroy my life, who wants to kill everything around me. But then Jesus came off his throne in heaven. He walked in this earth, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And he loved people, and he healed people. And he preached a good message of how to find life. And then he was killed on the cross. He hung on a cross, and they thought he was dead. And they thought it was over, and it was crazy. But then three days later, the stone was rolled away. He took a breath. He walked out, and then he ascended into heaven. And now he's sitting on his throne, and he's waiting for me. Don't you get it? And they were like, all right, we don't need you. And it, for six months, I had this time of hanging out with my mom, which I love my mom. I'm glad she was there for me. But I lost all the friends I had, and after about six months, I started to think, maybe this isn't worth it. You know, maybe this isn't what I thought it was. You know, I'm tired of going to Blockbuster with my mom every Friday night. You know, I I'm tired of, of walking through the halls in school and getting looked at like, man, he used to be fun. I'm tired of, of people going to lunch and, and, and not inviting me anymore. I'm tired of, of on the weekends feeling like I'm the only one who's not included in everything else that is happening. I'm tired of it. And so after about six months, I said, you know what? Maybe I, maybe I convinced myself that that happened. Maybe, maybe I convinced myself, and, and maybe there is a God, but maybe, I don't know. I, I'm so wrapped up and caught up in how I'm feeling right now as a junior in high school, and I don't want to feel this way anymore. So you know what? I'm going to go do me. I fell back into the old stuff. And then the next year, I went back to the same conference again. And guess what God did? He had a word. He said, I've been here the whole time. I've been waiting for you to come back. I've been waiting for something crazy to happen. Here I am. And that's when he said, Evan, I'm calling you into full-time ministry. And I said, me? Do you know what the last six months have looked like? He said, yeah, that's why I'm calling you into full-time ministry. Because I know that there's a calling on your life. And I left that weekend, and guess what? Got invited to the party. And I said, no, because there's this guy named Jesus, and he called me into ministry, and it's going to be amazing, and it's good. And they you know, and I, and I had, like, we go through these cycles, we go through these cycles. Man, so many of you have been here. We had some people stand up last night that's like, man, I'm tired of this cycle. Like, I don't want, you know, I stood up last year, and I stood up again this year, and I don't want to keep doing this cycle. And I'm telling you, life is full of cycles. Life is full of crazy things that are going to happen. And I'm telling you right now, I went through cycles, but one time, it stuck. And when it stuck, it was when I recognized that the promise of his story needed to overtake my story. Because when you know the end of the story, it changes how you live today. And I knew that there was a promise of who Jesus was, of what Jesus did, of what Jesus accomplished. But there was also a promise that Jesus was coming back. There was a promise that one day those trumpets would blast, the clouds would part, that Jesus is coming back on a white horse all tatted up with a sword coming out of his mouth, fire coming out of his eyes. And he's like, I'm back. And in that moment, I don't want to be, <sighs> I want to live my life to the fullest. I want to live in a way that shows the world who Jesus is. And here's the thing. Some of you are going to leave this weekend, and you're going to go back. And your friends, your family, somebody's going to be like, hey, what's up? You're like, oh, there's Jesus. It's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. And all of a sudden, feelings are going to start coming up, and feelings are going to start trying to debate. One of the questions we got asked yesterday is, what do I do when I go home? How do I go home? I want to tell you right now, nothing changes if we don't change. 
Nothing changes if we don't change. People won't understand the words that you say, but they'll understand the life that you live. You can come back and try and explain what happened here, but let me tell you what happened here was supernatural, so earthly words are not going to explain it. You can go back and be like, oh, it was, man, worship was crazy, and, and, and John and man, Bell, man, their voices were like angels and Fergie, and it was amazing, and, and it was so good, and, and, and man, Cameron came up here, and, and, and he like threw down, and oh, what did he say? Man, I can't remember what he said, but it was so good, and then Adam said he had a baby girl, and we said, oh, and it was like so amazing, and then the lights were going crazy, and the haze machine set off the fire alarm downstairs. And, and it was just like insane of what happened. And people would be like, what? Cameron, who? Worship. But I tell you what, you go back and your life looks different. The way you talk to people is different. The way you love people is different. The way you include people is different. The way you treat your parents is different. The way that you seek out those who might not be included, is different, people are going to start looking around and thinking, whoa, something happened. And that's when you can say, hey, there's this guy named Jesus, and one of two things will happen. <laughs> or, I need to know this Jesus. I need some change in my life. You see, what happens is in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, and we haven't really uh, done much background in Hebrews, but the author in Hebrews is writing to this church that is being persecuted, this church that is being destroyed, this church that is being killed and murdered and arrested and beaten and tortured, and, and they're starting to get to this place where they're like, you know what, I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if this is what we thought it was. I thought, you know, give my life to Jesus and, and things are going to be good, but you know what? Like their, their shops are getting destroyed. People are boycotting their businesses and, and they're losing money. Like all these things are happening and they're starting to think, maybe this was a bad choice. And the author in Hebrew says, this isn't who we are. There's a promise in his story that's greater than your story. And the promise is his, in his story is that he's won. The promise in his story is that victory's coming. The promise in his story is that if you can stand strong and you can be faithful and you can live in a way that you have been called to live, it's going to be greater than anything you could ever imagine. Here's what I believe. Is it's not about what we said this weekend. It's about what God did. It's not about any of the communicators up here that had a real catchy line. It's not about any of the communicators up here that got all fired up and started yelling. It's not about any of the worship band up here that jumped around and the lights spun around. All of it is important. All of it leads to something. All of it builds something. But what is important about this weekend is what God did in you. Because there is no problem that you will face that can compare to the spirit that lives inside of you. And that is what this author is saying. Get it. Come on. There is nothing facing you back home that God has not already faced. There is nothing facing you back home that God has not already defeated. There is nothing facing you back home that God is not saying, all right, good luck. See you next year. Because God doesn't live on this stage. God doesn't live in this microphone. God doesn't live in the lights or the haze or the loud music. God doesn't live in the screamer. Definitely not. God doesn't live down in the direct gym. God dwells inside of you. The same God living in you is the same God that spoke to you this weekend. You were just available to listen. When we leave here, how do I go home? I go home committed to being available to God. Committed to saying, I don't know what this is going to look like, but I'm going to make sure that I'm faithful in the moment. I love, there's, there's stories throughout the Gospels, honestly, throughout Scripture as a whole, where, where God does miraculous things and, and Jesus heals people. And there's this story in Mark chapter 3, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, okay, that's how I find my books in the Gospels. You ever, can anybody here find a letter in the alphabet and tell you what it's between without doing the whole alphabet? No, can't do it. 
Can't do it. What's next to Q? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, E, Q, R. R. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mark chapter 3, there's this story. And it says this. It says, another time Jesus went into the synagogue. And there was a man with a shriveled hand there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if Jesus would heal this man on the Sabbath. And so Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Someone's worst nightmare. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remain silent because they know it's smart not to answer Jesus when he asks a question that you know you have the wrong answer to. Jesus looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. And then his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees got all triggered, tried to figure out how they could kill Jesus. I think this is very important. Two things that I see in this story. The first thing is some advice for you. When Jesus walks in, he could point out anyone. There's Pharisees in the room, which the Pharisees were the top of the society. It's so easy when we walk into a room to see what we perceive as the top of the society. If we walked in here and, like, Denzel Washington was sitting up here, you'd be like, whoa, Denzel. You wouldn't even see anyone else. Denzel. Do you guys even know who Denzel is? Should I use someone else? One Direction is up here. No? The Jonas Brothers are up here. Maybe. I don't know. Tom Brady sitting right here. <laughs> oh, man. We do love to hate greatness. We love to hate those who are the greatest of all time. You know what I'm saying? It's easy to walk into a room when you walk into the cafeteria at school to see the popular crowd. When you walk into the cafeteria at school to see those who have got it all made. Jesus walks in, and who's the first person he notices? The one who's got an issue. The one who is probably outcasted. The one who is left behind. The one who is judged. Jesus walks in and he sees the one who needs some love before he sees anyone else. Can I challenge you as you go to school tomorrow? Could we just, hold on, hold on, hold on. You have an opportunity tomorrow to share with your community, to share with your school that you're different. School is not something, we joke about school all the time, but school is not something that you should begrudge. This is the greatest opportunity of your life to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have prisoners around you six hours a day, five days a week. You have an opportunity tomorrow to go home and show that Jesus is real. To show that Jesus did something. Jesus walked in and he noticed the one who was hurt. And then Jesus is savage, okay? Because he tells him, stand up in front of everyone. I'm going to show your weakness in front of everyone. Because the shriveled hand, man, he could have hit it. He could have had it in his pocket, in his robe, whatever he was wearing. Had it hidden. And Jesus is like, yo, stand up. Show me your hand. It's like, come on, Jesus, come on, can we do this later? No, stand up. Let me see your hand. It'd be like if in here, if I was just like, yo, you, dealing with pornography, stand up. You'd be like, can we do this later? You, dealing with disrespecting your parents, stand up. Come on, let's do this later. He says, man, stand up, show me your hand. And I want you to see in Scripture, this is so important to me. It's so, these words matter. It says, he stretched it out. 
he stretched his hand out before it was healed. It was still shriveled. It was still paralyzed. It was still all jacked up. And he says, I don't know why I'm showing this in front of everyone. This is a mess. This is what has kept me down. This is what pushed me down. I don't know why I'm doing this. But you know what? I know this feels wrong. This doesn't feel right. This feels like this is the opposite of what I should be doing. But Jesus has asked me to do something. And there's something about this man that I have faith in. And even if it doesn't make sense, I'm going to stretch it out before. I see what's going to happen. And he stretches his hand out, and it says, and then it was healed. There are some people in this room that as we leave here right now, you've got things in your mind and in your heart that you're like, okay, I know there's this decision i got to make, but it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like this is what the world wants me to do. It doesn't feel like this is natural. It doesn't feel like this is going to be comfortable. Guess what? It won't. It doesn't feel like this is going to be easy. It won't. But you know what? Jesus has asked me to do something. And I'm telling you, if you don't change, the world won't change. When Jesus asks you to do something, it's always to do something different. Jesus is calling us to something. Some of us in this room right now, we need to go home and apologize to our parents. Some of us in this room right now, we need to go home and apologize to that friend. Some of us in this room right now, we need to go home and say, Mom, I can't, I can't have my phone. I can't have a computer in my room anymore. Can you just take it out? Some of us in this room, we need to go home and, and, and we need to, to say, you know what? I've had this problem with lying, with gossiping. I've had this problem with this. Some of us in this room, we need to go home and, and we need to find that stash in our room that's in that sweet, awesome hiding spot that nobody would ever find. I had a coat hook on the back of my door that would unscrew and pull out. I could put anything I wanted in there, put it back in. I came home and I said, this, this doesn't feel right, but I know Jesus called me to do this. I pulled it out and I said, Mom, here is my hitter. Mom, here is my bong. Mom, here is everything that I've got right now I don't want it anymore and as my mom with tears rolling down her face is like I didn't I didn't know but she knew she's mom and it was the most uncomfortable thing I've ever done but I'm convinced because of that step of faith the next year I wasn't standing again for rededicating. I wasn't standing again for this and for that. I wasn't climbing out of the same grave, but because of that small step of faith and some people that came around me and said, we're going to pray for you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to help keep you on this path. I'm standing here in front of you, holding a microphone, talking about Jesus with a wife and two sons who love Jesus. You've been called to change something what you change tomorrow morning can change 15 years from now that can change thousands upon thousands of eternities you've been called to change nothing will change if you won't change Night one, this changes me. Jesus has pulled me out of the grave. I've been transformed. Night two, Jesus changes the enemy because if I'm changed, the enemy has changed. He doesn't have the power that I once thought he has. Night three, this changes family, community because if I'm changed and the enemy's changed, that means we come together and we can change the world. Today, this changes everything. This changes church. This changes the way we go to school. This changes the way we go to practice. This changes the way we take out the trash. This changes the way we mow the yard. This changes the way we, we shovel the driveway. This changes the way, let me give you a good practical thing. Band, you guys can go ahead and come on out. I'm going to wrap this up. Let me give you something practical right now. When you get home, your, your parents are going to say, how was it? And you're going to be like, oh, I'm tired. Yeah, it was all right. Oh, it was good. Can I say the first thing that you need to change right now is when your parents say, how was it? You take the time mentally to prepare yourself to sit down and say, it was great. Here's what Jesus did. Here's the people that I met. Here's something that happened that was amazing, that was fun. I wrote on this screamer, man, it was stupid. I rang a bell. Here's why I rang a bell. I've been freed. I've been called to act out in faith. Here's the change that I'm gonna make right now, mom. Here's a change that I'm going to make right now, Dad. Here's a change I'm going to make right now, Grandma, Grandpa. Here's a change that I'm going to make right now. And your mom's going to look at you like, whoa, I did not expect that. Change can happen. 
real quick. If God has changed one aspect of your life, not even the whole thing, one aspect of your life this weekend, can you just raise your hand? If God can change one thing, he can change everything. Let's let him. Come on, God, we lift this up to you this morning. Come on, God, we praise you. Come on, God, we're ready to celebrate you. Come on, God, we want to explain, exclaim how good you are. Come on. God, you are beautiful, you're powerful, you're amazing. I want us to shout with everything we have of how good you are. The kitchen crew told me this morning that last night in their dorm, they could hear the roar of cheers coming from the pool as people were being baptized into the kingdom, going throughout the mountains, reverberating, echoing in between the mountains. And we want to worship right now in a way that lets the world know, these mountains know, that you are God. Come on, let's stand and worship together.